Good morning to each of you. I welcome you here to Northstone Baptist Church. Go ahead and stand with me, please, if you would. Welcome those of you that are here in person as well as those of you that are watching via live stream. I want to publicly thank the choir uh, for singing so beautifully and in specific singing a song that is gospel heavy. The theological term that was running through my mind while they were singing that song is the idea of imputation. Uh, his robes for mine. It's the idea of, of his righteousness being imputed to our account and our unrighteousness being imputed to his account. It's an incredible exchange. And here's what the choir just endeavored to do is they endeavored to help us set the tone and the perspective that all of us should have as we approach the worship hour that is before us. I love how the songwriter there said, my praise, my all shall be for Christ alone. I hope you've come to this place with the idea that you're going to praise him, Christ alone. Often my opening prayer, and we'll have an opening prayer in just a moment, is along the same lines that I just described the choir's goal. You know, their goal is to set the perspective that's a gospel perspective, a worship mindset. And then my opening comments Sunday after Sunday and my opening prayer are specifically geared to that same endeavor. Because like we all got things running through our brain that will distract us from what should be the focal point of this gathering. Um, if I were to summarize the focal point of this gathering in one word, it would be Jesus. Let's pray together if we could. Father, thank you for the gospel truths we were just reminded of so beautifully as our choir sang. I pray that it would be true of us that our praise, our all, would be for Christ alone. I pray that as we sing congregationally, we would sing with great enthusiasm because of this idea of imputation because as the church gathers the church is a redeemed people we have been made righteous not because of our own merit but because of your only begotten son so father we just marvel at your grace and your goodness and therefore we sing your praise we study your word we fellowship with your people we give to your cause and Father, help us to do all these things that are before us through the lens of the gospel. And Father, help us not just today, but tomorrow and every day to come to live out our lives, looking at our lives through the lens of the gospel. Because we know you are worthy of our time, our talent, and our treasure. So, Father, thank you for what you have done for us. Help us to understand it is our logical, our reasonable service to then live for you. We sure love you. We love you always. We love you and thank you that you loved us before we ever loved you. We know that we have everything to thank you for and certainly nothing to complain about. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 412 remain standing if you would. You have several opportunities to participate in our service, and one of those ways is by singing and lifting your voice. So number 412, moment by moment, join me as we sing on that first verse, moment by moment.
towards the end, are you looking to Jesus? As it says, are you looking to Jesus till glory to shine, till he either returns or we're taken up to heaven? We, have, we, we need to look to Jesus, looking unto Jesus. Right across the page, number 413, my father planned it all, what though the way be lonely and dark the shadows fall, I know wherever it leadeth, my father planned it all. Well, on that first verse, number 413. Thank you for the good music we've had here this morning. Lord, we pray now that you would be with our pastor as he brings a message. And Lord, just continue to bless us and bless these offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'm old fashioned, I love to hear the organ in church. <clears throat> I like the piano too, by the way. <laughs> Scripture reading this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, Philippians chapter 1 as we continue our study through Philippians. We'll be reading Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through 30. And if you're able and when you found it, if you'd please stand out of respect for the, God's word. Philippians chapter 1, I'll read verse 27, you read verse 28, I'll read 29, and then we'll all read verse 30 together. First, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And we'll read together verse 30. Having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word as it's given to us. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, who through the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, gave these words to the Philippians, and now in turn we get to read them as well. I pray that you be with pastor as he shares this with us, Lord, and help us to understand that it's our conversation, it's our way of life, it's our testimony, Lord, that is important to those around us. And so, Father, I pray that you'd teach us what you have for us from your word this morning, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Remain standing, please. Take your hymnals once again and turn to number 414, a number 414 familiar gospel song, Trust and Obey. We walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. What a glory He sheds on our way. What we do is goodwill. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and go Trust and go
Thank you, Sister Gibbs. Thank you, Brother Jonathan, as well, for accompanying her. Uh, sometimes after a song like that uh, and delivered so beautifully, I feel like I lack the words to really express like, how I feel about that. I mean, it's just so beautiful. And to say it's so beautiful uh, doesn't even seem like it covers uh, just how I feel about it. And it's beautiful, of course, because of the way it was delivered, which is maybe the more obvious. Uh, but it's also beautiful because of the words that were communicated and in relationship to our desperate need of him. Um, and, and so, just wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I get to dismiss the young people. I, uh, the young people say, no, you get, you get to dismiss us, right? Like, they're the ones thrilled about it here. Uh, they get to go and hang out with two of my favorite people, Britson and Matthew, in the junior church area. So if you are a child ages four through the third or fourth grade-ish, Somewhere in there, you can follow uh, Britton and Matthew and uh, participate in all the glories of Junior Church in the other building. All right, Evelyn is the straggler this morning. I invite you, if you would, take the Word of God and turn, please, to the book of Philippians. 
We do have uh, the Shining Light players going to be with us here this evening. Uh, so we have a production tonight, and I'll say more about that in my closing announcements. That's why the regular pulpit is not here. They were here practicing yesterday, and so uh, they took down that, that uh, larger pulpit, and so I have this littler one. So if you see papers falling off, uh, you'll understand. Uh, I'm hoping uh, to cover all this as the Lord enables me uh, in a way that don't, that, where I don't drop anything. Um, and let me say, say it this way about what is before us in the preaching portion of our worship service, and that is that, that we need to hear from the Lord. And the way to hear from the Lord is to listen to the voice of His Spirit as we together open the Word of the Lord. Because all week long we hear many voices, I mean, in the voice of the, re the, the retailers, you know, capitalism and all the commercials and everybody trying to sell you their product and you hear all those voices and you hear the news media throughout the week talking about all the, the current events and those voices are loud in the heads and minds of many of us and maybe all week long you're hearing the voice of your carnal heart and your selfish desires and uh, your comfort zone, you know, advocating for itself. Throughout a week, uh, lots of voices, and yet what we have in Bible preaching is the opportunity to hear the voice of the Lord through the Spirit of God and through His Word. I encourage you to follow along. I endeavor to be a Bible preacher, and, um, and by that I mean I endeavor to walk us through a text, the text that was um, delivered in the Scripture reading. It's Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, and I am telling you, you will get so much more out of this message if you will open a copy of God's Word and try to follow along as I lead us through this text. And um, not only that, but you can verify that what the preacher is saying is indeed, thus saith the Lord. Um, it's not about the preacher as much as it should be about the one he is endeavoring to proclaim, and that is our God. And so, uh, whatever stage of life you are, younger or older, I invite all of you uh, to look on. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, look on with somebody sitting next to you or use a pew Bible that should be available for you. Um, but, but use an app, whatever, on your phone or something without playing solitaire, okay? Uh, but just your Bible app and follow along as we endeavor to together unpack this text so that we can hear the voice of the Lord. Because I promise you, he has something to say to you. And if you will, if you haven't as of yet, if you will ask him to speak to you through the preaching and teaching of his word, the God that I know, the God of this Bible, I'm sure he will answer that prayer in the affirmative for you. All right, so we will entitle these verses, Philippians chapter 1, 27 through 30. We'll give them this title, and that is Gospel Behavior. Gospel Behavior. We draw this idea from verse number 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Um, the idea of conversation in verse number 27 is the idea of conduct or behavior. It's the idea of lifestyle. It is used over and over and over again in the New Testament. Sometimes in this 21st century, when we see the word conversation, we think of conversing verbally having a bit of a dialogue, and yet in the first century, the uh, main idea here is not just conversing uh, linguistically, but it is conducting oneself in a specific manner. And so uh, Paul is penning inspired words as he's moved by the Spirit of God, and he says, let your conversation, let your behavior be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. So you can see why we would call this gospel behavior. Can I say that there is a right way and a wrong way for a Christian to conduct themselves? Let that sink in for just a minute. There are people that would fancy themselves to be theologians that would disagree with the simple sentence I just offered. And yet it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and this text and many other texts uh, where you find the idea of, of conduct that pleases God, and I use that idea of pleasing God from 1 Thessalonians 4, in contrast to conduct, Christian behavior, that would then displease God. 
So there is a way, a, a way to behave in light of the gospel. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, have you noticed, if you've been here on previous Sunday mornings, as we started in Philippians 1.1, we've carried, uh, worked our way through uh, th these preceding verses, maybe you notice a little bit of a different tone in the text. Um, if you reflect back on the previous content, you would maybe recognize that the first portion of chapter 1 is really testimony from the Apostle Paul. And now we find transitional contents to more of an exhortation. More instruction is what it is, as opposed to testimony. I mean, previously he's testifying about how much he loves the partners in the gospel, those that are saved there at the church at Philippi. He's testifying about um, his, his plight, his imprisonment, and how these things have happened rather under the furtherance of the gospel. He's even testifying concerning uh, the, those that have animosity towards him. He's testifying about how he treats his critics. And in verse number 18, he says that they are preaching Christ. And so in spite of the strife that they're causing, uh, he says, I rejoice, you know, and therein I will rejoice. He's testifying about all these things. He's even testifying about life and death circumstances, you know, because for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And, and it is more needful for you that I should stay with you and, and serve you. I mean, all of that is testimony. And now he transitions to giving instruction to the people of God. And, and don't get me wrong, from the testimony, you glean a lot of instruction, exhortation. We made many applications as we walked through those verses. But, but what is occurring in 27 through 30 is specific instruction for believers. How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? Would you say amen? amen? Then you are a believer, and this instruction is for you. And it is for me. It is instruction in relationship to gospel behavior. And uh, that is the title for the morning message, but uh, I want to give you some headings. And if you're a note taker, I give them to you here at the outset, and then uh, you can jot them down now maybe, and then uh, we'll walk through these ideas as we walk through the text together. But first, and they all start with the letter A. First, we'll see in the text, we'll see the idea of accountability. Now, secondly, we will see the idea of action, or specifically athletics that are described in the text. And then thirdly and finally this morning, the content describes our adversaries. Adversaries. So what does gospel behavior look like? Well, it includes accountability. There is a, an action called for, and then he addresses the adversaries or the opponents of, of the gospel. All right, so back to verse number 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, notice this idea of accountability. This is the first uh, heading for the morning, the first point for the morning. Accountability is described. Um, he says that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So the phrase in the middle of verse number 27, whether Paul is there in person or whether he is absent, he's going to hear of their affairs all of that describes a measure of accountability. Um, so, so some of you think about maybe your parents. And um, when your parents are in your presence, maybe you conduct yourself uh, in a way <laughs> that would be pleasing to your parents. And uh, when the cat's away, the mice will play. You know, when they're not there, maybe you are, your conduct is a little different. Maybe you uh, have a longer leash or whatever it is. Um, I like to think that my children are exactly the same when their father is there versus when their father is not, but come on, I don't want to be that naive. Um, and that is one reason why I regularly remind my children to abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. It's easier when your authority, your pastor, your, uh, your, your parent, even the police officer, you know, I mean, when the authority is watching, we tend to conduct ourselves in a certain way. But when they're not there, that's when we put the gas down, you know, and we think, I'll be fine. It's interesting how he talks about the idea of his presence versus his potential absence. 
but the accountability comes on a couple levels, and that is that he will hear of their affairs. You know, he will hear how they conduct themselves. And if you've read the entire book of Philippians, you know there were people conducting themselves in a way that, that wasn't in line with gospel behavior. I mean, remember in chapter 4, these two ladies, Eotis and Santiki, had conflict one with another? And Paul addresses them and says that they should be like-minded. I mean, he heard about that, and he includes it in the letter. He's, he's getting wind of some of the way they're conducting their own Christian lives. And he is, in this book, uh, praising the ones that are conducting themselves in a way that pleases the Lord, and then he is confronting those that are uh, uh, conducting themselves in a way that displeases the Lord. It's a measure of accountability. And what we can further draw from this, he says, yes, I may be there, I may not be there, but I will hear about it. There's accountability there. The spiritual leader is going to know. Um, I talked about t reminding my boys to abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good because they are going to be by themselves. And as they get to be men and they're out of our house, I'm hoping as a father that those Bible-based words from the book of Romans are going to ring true in their mind. But you know another verse that a lot of Christian parents quote to their children is that Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. Um, Paul's saying whether I'm here or not, I'm going to hear, whether I'm there or not in person, I'm going to hear about it. And, and then he also, the other implication in verse number 27 is, though I may not be there with you in person all the time, the gospel is with you all the time. I mean, the idea, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Uh, in other words, we understand uh, John's writing, John chapter 16, the idea uh, that the comforter would come, and, and Jesus is leaving his disciples, and in uh, Acts chapter 2, the fulfillment of that uh, prophetic uh, utterance would, would be accomplished, and indeed the Holy Spirit comes and indwells uh, believers, those that have received the gospel. So, uh, being the present possessor of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, live out this life in a way that reflects the gospel. Paul will hear of their affairs, but he can't be present all the time, but the gospel is always with you. So, look at, as I said in my opening prayer, look at your life through the lens of the gospel. He describes accountability. Not only that, consider with me secondly, the idea of actions, or I've described it also as athletics. Athletics. Um, athletics includes action, you understand. But the reason I'm highlighting the idea of athletics is because in verse number 27, this word striving, striving together, it is an athletic reference right there. Um, and you understand the word together, striving together. So this is not a description of an individual sport, necessarily, a sport where one individual uh, is honored for his individual success, but it is striving together. It is, it is many people participating in a unified way to accomplish a common goal. Um, it's the idea of action, taking certain action, or athletics. And, and consider what these actions look like, all right? Uh, it, and we are a sports family. Uh, we, I grew up uh, throwing a football around and, and hitting the baseball, and I grew up in Minnesota, so I played some hockey. Uh, I'm a right-handed person, but uh, the first hockey stick that was ever handed to me was a left-handed hockey stick. Nobody told me that, and so I learned to play hockey left-handed. And uh, the idea of any of these sports, and more than any of the sports I just referenced, football, baseball, or hockey, uh, we, I think, are a basketball family, and so we enjoy basketball, and lately we've been into running, and Mark is a cross-country runner, and uh, his old man tries to run a little now and again, and uh, just watching him, I get out of breath. Uh, but, uh, yeah, all these, all these sports, right? And the goal of, of hockey is to advance the puck. You know, get it across that half. Before you can get it in the goal, you've got to get it across the halfway marker, and then the three-quarter, and then hopefully, you, you know, and the same thing with football is advance it to the end zone. And basketball, advance the ball. And hopefully five people are unified with their pick and roll schemes uh, or whatever uh, the triangle, the Phil, Phil Jackson uh, triangle, whatever offense you want to run, just, you know, get that ball it, it, together as a team in that hoop. Um, 
And, and there's a similar illustration here given. Um, so, so what are the actions that are described here? What, what athletic positions uh, are, are given to us by the Holy Spirit? Notice this idea in verse, uh, the middle of, towards the end of verse 27. The first one is that you stand fast. So your posture is um, the idea of that which is solid or firm. You stand fast. Um, you're not going to be knocked over by the opposition. No, you stand your ground. You're not going to be intimidated by them. No, you stand firm. Um, so the action is stand firm. Not only that, but there is an emphasis here on unity in the team. Unity among uh, your, your partners, to use uh, the idea in verse number 5 of chapter 1, your fellowship in the gospel. These are his partners in the gospel. Uh, Christians should be unified in the common goal of advancing the gospel. So he says, stand fast, and then he says, in one spirit. It speaks of unity, in one spirit with one mind, striving together. All of this has to do with the idea of unity. Um, sometimes when preachers preach about unity, people sometimes assume that that pastor is rather ecumenical, willing to compromise on uh, things that really matter. And there is certainly a distinction to be made uh, between biblical principle and personal preference. Biblical principles are that which we should be dogmatic about, and personal preferences are uh, things that we understand, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, may differ from us on certain things. It's not a matter of ecumenicism. It's a matter really of just loving uh, the gospel and those that have received the gospel and then together trying to advance that glad tidings, those, the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a matter of identifying the difference between biblical principle and personal preference or that which is considered first order issues and that which is third order issues or, or tertiary doctrines. Um, things that good Christian people can uh, debate and, and consider and reconsider. Uh, but understanding they're Christian people and so we want to uh, have a unified front uh, because we're together trying to advance the ball, if you will, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people will draw those lines in, in different places and I get that, but but do you know that a distinguishing characteristic of a Christian ought to be unity with other Christians? Um, and if you're not persuaded, would you look over at the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 5, please? Galatians, as Paul is writing to the Galatian believers, it goes into great depth as far as defining the gospel and uh, addressing what the gospel truly is versus what it is not. And so Paul wrote Galatians, Paul also wrote Philippians, same author here. Of course, the, the Holy Spirit is the author of all of the Bible. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse number, uh, verse number 14. And I hope, I hope you'll follow this, this is so interesting. He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We're talking about unity. He says in verse number 15, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Isn't it frustrating when people supposed to be on the same team are busy biting and devouring one another? No wonder the cause of Christ seems to be so muted and the influence of Christians muted in what was originally a Christian country. Founded on the Judeo-Christian ethic. Notice verse number 16, but uh, he says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I would suggest that biting and devouring one another um, is the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. It indicates you're not walking in the Spirit. All right, if this isn't enough for you, consider with me also John chapter 17. Would you go there? Some of you are very familiar with the Lord's Prayer, and you probably know right where I'm going. John chapter 17 is the, the true Lord's Prayer. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, indeed Jesus did that, uh, but that was the model prayer 
Uh, this is the Lord's Prayer. This is at, John 17 records for us Jesus actually praying. If you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll see that the majority of John 17 is all red letters, and it is Jesus praying to His Father. And if you want an outline for John 17, you'll notice that first of all, He prays for Himself. Jesus does. It's not wrong to pray for yourself. I've heard people say that. Um, then he prays for his disciples, those that are already saved. And then thirdly, in John 17, he prays for those that will be saved. You know how you can apply that? And that is that, that Jesus actually prayed for us because we were yet to be saved. It's incredible. But Jesus himself prayed that the disciples of, uh, uh, that his disciples, that we would be unified. It's John chapter 17. Notice verse number 21. You can see verse number 20, actually, where he says, uh, he's talking about praying, and he says, neither pray I for these alone, these are the things he's previously mentioned in the, the preceding verses, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So, so the disciples have already trusted Christ, and so we are in this group that are yet to believe, at least at the point of, of this writing. We haven't even been born yet, you understand. So he's praying for our unity in verse number 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. So wow, that is such unity described between the Father and the Son, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In other words, when Christian people are fighting among themselves over nonsense issues, it doesn't help to, to reach the world. But what does help reach the world is that we would model such a unity, a commonality of, of the promotion and propagation of the gospel that the world may believe that God sent Jesus. It's an emphasis on unity. Unity. So he calls the team, again in this athletic illustration, to stand fast, stand firm in the gospel. And then he calls them to be unified as a group. And again, it's not unity for the sake of unity. It's not just unity that you see a military operation maybe and, and whatever country that military may represent, they may have this agenda or that agenda and in order to accomplish that agenda, they must be unified. It's not just uh, unity for the sake of unity, but it is unity in this text for the sake of the gospel. One spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. It is striving together. Um, several of the men in the church, uh, a couple, three or four of us, have ran, gone on runs together. I, I mentioned I have been into running a little bit lately, and uh, yesterday I got to go with Brother Ken, and he took me to the trails, uh, which are like right in the middle of Pensacola. I had no idea. Wooded trails, some of you have probably been there. A lot of people ride like mountain bikes on those trails, and some people will run. And, uh, while, and I had no idea where I was in those woods, and there are many, many acres of woods, and the trails are terrific. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, see me after and I will try my best to describe where they are. Just over off a like 10 mile road in Palifax, somewhere back up in there by some golf power thing close to University of West Florida. Anyhow, you don't have to see me after. I just told you everything I know. But, uh, but listen, if I didn't have Ken with me, I would have been lost in those woods still right now, just wandering around probably. And uh, anyhow, he, he, so we ran together. And, and while we're running, and those of you that have, have done running or been into running, uh, you know you have a lot of time to think about stuff. And, uh, and I was like, while I'm following him through all these woods, I'm thinking we are literally doing what the, the picture here is in the book of Philippians. We're striving together. We're running together through these woods. And, um, and, and, and our goals are what typical people's goals are. You know, when you're out there running, your goals are maybe the endorphins or the mental benefit or just uh, the fellowship or, or whatever it is. And, and you can have innumerable goals for why you team up with somebody uh, to do something. But what Paul is saying is that Christian people, when you want to understand gospel behavior, first understand the accountability, but also understand the specific actions that, that Christian people are called to. You are called to stand fast in the gospel 
And you are called to be unified around the gospel so that you don't bite and devour one another. And this is even the prayer of Jesus. You ever wonder if, you know, you think about your prayers and some of your prayers. God can answer your prayers, by the way, in one of three ways. He can answer them with yes. God, please heal so-and-so. Please help so-and-so. Please heal me or help me. And he could say yes, and you're healed and you're helped. And it's wonderful. Or he could say no, which he did to the Apostle Paul. You know, I have a thorn in the flesh. And he essentially said, no, Paul, but my grace is sufficient for you. Um, or the third way he can answer is he could say, wait, wait. And it'll be a time, and you will maybe learn some things as you face the adversity that he's allowed in your life, and you wait, and then you find the value in suffering. And indeed, there is great value in that. This text later on even teaches us that. Um, so he can answer yes, no, or wait. It's interesting that Jesus in his humanity prayed John 17. And I wonder, I wonder how the Father answers the prayer for unity. You know, yes, you know, from the Son. The Son is praying to the Father to unify the believers to the point that it would reflect the unity the Son has with the Father. Yes, no, or wait. It's interesting, too, that, that prayer, an answered prayer, has a human element to it. Like, we have part in answering Jesus' prayer to the Father in the affirmative based on our understanding of the importance that we unify together around the gospel. It's all very interesting. What does this athletic picture look like? It's stand fast and firm in the gospel, that we are unified, that we are striving together for the faith of the gospel. You say, Pastor Johnson, what is the gospel? Well, look with me, please, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What are we standing firm in? What uh, is this that we are to uh, unify around? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a summary of the gospel. I think it is one of many passages that describe the gospel, but maybe this is the most concise description of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, if you're uh, trying to witness to somebody, the best way to do that really is to give them your testimony of salvation. Um, and if you're looking to point them to Scripture, and you always should be looking to do that, this is a terrific passage to bring someone to. 1 Corinthians 15 describes the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. The Apostle Paul preached it to the Corinthian believers, um, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. They're uh, believers. They're saved. They've received the gospel. Verse number 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I, have preached, what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, we talked about issues of first importance. Here's where we get that. The gospel is a, a, an issue that, that stands paramount. It is first of all. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which, also, uh, that which I also received. How that? Here's the gospel. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. If you're thankful for that, say amen. Listen, all the elements of the gospel are right here in these first four verses. The fact that people are sinners is right here in these first four verses. Because he died for our sins. If you don't tell somebody that they're a sinner, you did not just give them the gospel. By the way, if you prayed uh, what you think is a saving prayer, but you never identified that you're a sinner, you don't understand the gospel. And I know it's the ugly part, if you will, of, uh, of a beautiful story. But in order for anybody to appreciate the beauty, you have to contrast it with the carnality that is our human flesh. Christ died for sinners. Sinners such as us. Christ died. It speaks to substitutionary atonement. As I talked earlier about uh, the idea of imputation. Uh, read, and I was reading while the choir was singing, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 in the English, I think is 25 words, and in the Greek language, it's 15. 
And it is some of the most beautiful words in the canon of Scripture because it describes substitutionary atonement. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Christ died for our sins. And that was prophesied according to the Scripture. Uh, Paul wants us to know that. I think a reference probably to Isaiah 53 and other Old Testament passages. And then he was buried. Tell me more about the gospel, Pastor Johnson. Well, Paul tells us that he rose again. Easter's right around the corner, and many of us will celebrate our risen Savior on Easter. But do you understand that every Sunday, it's the first day of the week, every Sunday is a commemoration of our risen Savior. Um, yes, he died, and he died for our sins, and that's, the gospel, that's part of the gospel. But the other part of the gospel, the, the, the pretty part, the beautiful part, the good news is that he didn't stay dead. He was buried, yeah. But up from the grave, he arose. He's alive. How can any of us have eternal life in heaven? Well, he conquered death. Our God conquered death, and he is the God of life. It's beautiful. Every Sunday is a commemoration of our risen Savior. That's why you ought to start the week out by gathering with God's people to reflect on uh, our risen Savior, to worship and adore uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, it rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's what the gospel is. Gospel behavior understands the accountability that the gospel is with us always, understands the action that we're to stand fast and be unified, striving together for the faith of the gospel. But then gospel behavior also takes into consideration the adversaries. And this is the final idea for the morning. The adversaries. And this is what 28 through 30 is really dedicated to. All three of those verses dedicated to dealing with those that would oppose the gospel. Um, and I think I'm correct to say, and some of you that know the Greek language better than I um, could, could tell me uh, later if I'm incorrect on this, but I'm pretty sure that 27, 28, 29, and 30 are all one sentence. Um, and yet we divide them up, of course, uh, because we uh, want to better understand them. Um, but, but in the original, this is all one sentence of what I said at the beginning of instruction. Instruction. Um, and 28 now, 29 and 30, he gives us instruction in relationship to our adversaries. So if you are striving together for the faith of the gospel in a unified way, standing firm on the gospel in an athletic way, don't forget that there's another team, if you will. There are people that are trying to keep the puck out of the goal. There are people trying to keep the ball out of the net. There are people that don't want that football in that end zone. There are opposers, adversaries of the gospel. And here's what he says about those people. The world, the flesh, the devil, the enemies of the gospel. He says in verse number 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. In other words, don't be fearful of those that oppose the gospel. You're not terrified. You're not alarmed. As a matter of fact, if you're familiar with the New Testament over and over, the New Testament tells us there will be opposition to the gospel. So expect it. Be prepared for it. The more vocal you are with the good news of Jesus Christ, the more likely it is that you will face extreme opposition. So expect it. Don't be terrified from it. Don't be alarmed by it. And because, verse 28 continues, it is to them an evident token of perdition. Perdition is the idea of destruction. The world and those that hate the gospel are, are very sadly going to be destroyed in eternal hell. An evident token of who their God is unless they trust Christ. Their destruction, but then contrastingly, the end of verse number 28 describes your salvation. One group of people, the people that stand in opposition to the gospel, it's an evident token of their perdition. But it is an expression of your salvation and that of God, it says. Uh, in other words, people that are saved, we are going to face persecution or opposition. Expect it. Except, except if you're hiding your light under a bushel. You're saved, but you don't want anybody to know. 
You never talk about Jesus at the workplace. You don't want to lose the opportunity to get a raise. So you're real quiet about it. You don't care what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13 through 16 about let your light so shine before men and be salt and light. Yeah, yeah, Pastor Johnson, that's all cute and stuff. But you don't understand, I got a paycheck. You don't understand, Pastor Johnson, I got a social standing. I don't want people to think I'm some kind of religious weirdo. And so you mute your voice. I'm just saying, Paul is telling us that if you uh, will stand with this kind of gospel behavior, stand firm in the gospel with other people, striving together for the advancement of the gospel, if you, in a public way, team up with other people so that Christ is preached, there will be people that oppose you. They that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, if you don't live godly in Christ Jesus, you live like the world lives, nobody's even going to know that you had some kind of conversion experience. If you mute your voice and never speak a word for Jesus, yeah, you're not going to suffer any persecution. It's just interesting that when we do what God tells us to do, to be vocal with the good news of Jesus Christ, he also says there will be suffering. And he continues to explain that, verse number 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to them uh, not only to believe on him, oh, this is so good. My time is gone. I want you to understand this, though. The idea of given in verse number 29 carries with it the idea of a gift. Somebody gave you something. What did you receive as a gift? Well, you received belief or salvation. Not only the belief on him was given to you. You understand Ephesians 2.8 describes the gospel as a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift. So your belief is a gift to you. But you know what else is a gift to you in verse number 29? Suffering for his sake. Pastor Johnson, did you just say that suffering is a gift? Well, Paul did, and I'm just restating it. It was given to us. It's part of the Christian walk, especially for those that endeavor to live out the implications of the gospel and communicate the gospel to a lost and dying world. And there are so many lessons that come from suffering whether it's physical, even spiritual, through your testimony. There's so many things we learn, physical, even through exercise. There's so many benefits of suffering. But suffering for his sake, it's a gift. And Paul wants them to know, verse 30, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. You know, literally, he's writing this while he's suffering. Don't forget he's in Roman prison and he's shackled to a guard and he's like, yeah, salvation's a gift, but so is suffering. And Paul is telling them he is experiencing both of those gifts in the present moment that he writes this book as he's moved by the Spirit of God. So what does gospel behavior look like? Well, it re recognizes accountability, not only through the authority, spiritual authorities that may or may not be in our lives present at different moments, but it recognizes that accountability because the gospel is with us always. What does gospel behavior look like? It includes certain actions, standing fast and unified and striving together. What does gospel behavior look like? Well, we conduct ourselves in a specific way when it comes to our adversaries. And if you didn't pay attention, the whole chapter is really, is, is really summarized in this exhortation. Like, like, just real quick, think about the chapter. How am I going to handle other Christians? Because he talks about other Christians that he loves, that are partners with him in the gospel, verse number five. Well, I'm going to look at those other Christians through the lens of the gospel. This whole chapter is dedicated to gospel behavior, essentially. How am I going to behave around other Christians? Well, I'm going to treat them with an understanding of the gospel. How am I going to behave when it comes to circumstances beyond my control? Because you get to verse number 12, and he says, the things that have happened unto me, you know, circumstances beyond his control, they've fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. He's in jail. They seized him. He couldn't fight him off, even if he wanted to fight him off. There's too many of them. He is in jail, and he's chained. How are you going to deal with other Christians? Yes, then he transitions to how are you going to deal with circumstances beyond your control? Well, Paul's saying, I'm going to look at it through the lens of the gospel. These things have happened unto me rather under the furtherance of the gospel. Then in the chapter, he deals with his critics. How are you going to deal with your critics? How many of you just love your critics? No. We, it's not easy for us to love them. 
Well, we're going to deal with them through the lens of the gospel because Christ is preached in this situation and he therein does rejoice. What about life and death situation? Some of you this week have experienced walking through the valley of the shadow of death, losing somebody you love. I got a phone call this morning from folks in Indiana that we love. And an adult man is weeping, telling me that his mother very likely has passed. And there's other circumstances. I won't share the story right now. But how are you going to deal with life and death situations? This chapter gives us the answer, and that is, Paul says, I'm going to look at life and death through the lens of the gospel. In life, Christ is going to be magnified. And for me to live is Christ. But even in death, to die is gain. You know why? For the Christian, because to be with Christ is far better. I'm going to look at life through the lens of the gospel. And then God is going to be pleased with my life. Gospel behavior. It's just whatever comes today, tomorrow, and the days uh, following, whether it's unexpected, whether it's Christian people, whether it's critics, whether it's life or death, all of it, Paul's saying in this chapter, I'm looking at it through the lens of eternity. Because when those opposers, those adversaries come, we tend to panic. The whole book is about your mind. What are you thinking when you face these kinds of things? You should be thinking things in relationship to the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Would you bow with me, please, for prayer? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to say something just as important as anything I've said already. And, and I, I, I want to carry but a moment while people are stirring because I really want you to hear this. And that is, I would suggest that even Christian people, especially in the Bible Belt, we have somehow forgotten how to look at our lives through the lens of the gospel. And we panic in uncertain circumstances. Or we sorrow in a carnal way, not a godly way, but a carnal way when we face unexpected things. And what Paul does in this whole chapter is say, I'm looking at life through the lens of the gospel and the implications of the gospel. And he calls Christian people to do the same thing. And if Christians in 21st century America, all throughout the Bible Belt, would get a hold of this truth, we would see the country that we love come back to Jesus and come back to the book upon which it was founded. I mean, we would see people saved because we'd be evangelistic and we'd be looking at our lives, the expected, the unexpected, the good and the bad. We'd be looking at all of it through the lens of the gospel. If we can apply this truth it would revolutionize not only our lives, not only our homes, our church, our community, and potentially our country. Paul's single-minded focus is exactly what all of us need. Single-minded focus on Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help me to practice what I preach. Help me to believe how I help me to behave how I believe. Help each of us to have listened to the voice of the Spirit of God and the Word of God this morning. We understand that when the Word of God is preached, the voice of God is heard. As best as I know how, I've just endeavored to preach your Word. And so, Father, I pray that these, your people, would be sanctified, would, would as John 17, 17 tells us, because they've heard the truth that is your Word, that we would be like Christ. And Father, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, then so much of what I just said didn't make any sense to them because they need to receive the gospel. They need to admit that they're a sinner and that Christ died for them and that he rose and now offers them everlasting life. So, Father, I pray that you do what only you can do in their hearts, that they would trust you today before it's eternally too late. And then for those of us that are Christians, thank you for how you spoke to us today and help us to not just hear it, but to do it by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? Hymn number 496, as you have need to come, please come. And I hope every one of us will be in a spirit of prayer and reflection in relationship to what the Lord taught us, 496. On that first verse of number 496, I surrender all.
you would. I'm going to ask my wife to come to the platform, dear, if you would, and she's going to give us an announcement here in just a minute. I want to walk through uh, several of these announcements. Uh, and that is that there is choir practice for the choir at 4.45 this evening. And instead of being in here, it will be in the fellowship hall. The choir is not singing uh, tonight, but there is still practice at 4.45. Uh, they're not singing because tonight the Shining Light players will perform uh, here on the platform at North Stone Baptist Church, and they are going to deliver a musical based on the incredible true story of Amy Carmichael, a missionary to India. Uh, so I do want to encourage everybody to come and to benefit from uh, that production. We've had, we've hosted the Shining Light players in the past, and they do a terrific job and first class, and uh, so you'll enjoy that, so be here this evening. Um, and then also want to mention ladies' Bible study at Marty Ainsworth's house is this Monday, tomorrow night. Um, and then um, Tuesday this week is the ladies' fellowship meeting, and Britton will explain more about that in just a moment. I do want to remind you that uh, Wednesday, April the 7th uh, through Monday, April the 12th, our church will be hosting the war. It is um, not a description of your marriage, hopefully, but it is uh, instead an evangelistic event. Uh, that uh, we team up with evangelist Bobby Bossler, and uh, they will come and, uh, and help us reach teenagers in the area. Uh, Brother Kaiser and Sister Callhammer uh, are helping us coordinate that, and there's a sign-up sheet if you want to help, um, help us with that event. Uh, we sure would appreciate that, so uh, check out that sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. And then if you're a visitor here this morning at North Stone Baptist Church. We really are glad that you're here. And uh, Linda Wasser is in the back. Linda, would you wave your hand there? She's wearing purple. Purple is my favorite color. Linda's back there. And um, she has a gift for you if you're a visitor. So don't miss out on that gift. And uh, so please stop back by there and she'll have a little card. We want to connect uh, with you, a little connect card. And, uh, and by the way, uh, church family at large, if there are ways that my wife and I can serve you or minister to you, please contact us and let us know. Sometimes it's hard when we're up here uh, just shaking hands quickly or greeting people quickly, uh, maybe for you to share things that you're going through. Uh, but I want you to know we are here uh, to serve you. And so um, if there are ways that we can do that better, uh, please let us know. Um, and we're happy to, to oblige in those ways. All right, Britton, would you come? I just came from junior church. We were doing a good round of uh, Father Abraham, so I'm out of breath. I learned that uh, the older I get, Father Abraham is more difficult, but Matthew's in there with him. So um, I don't have any shenanigans like I usually do for my announcements, but I did think of several. I thought of having Pastor stand here, and we had a code word, and every time he, I said the code word, he'd have to put a piece of gum in his mouth. Or I thought of having my boys come up here and see who could blow a bubble first but none of them actually worked out. So um, how many of you have a piece of gum in your mouth right now? Raise your hand, Karen. We're kindred spirits. Nobody else? Ser seriously? Mint? Oh, Mark does, okay, good. Well, I always have a piece of gum in my mouth for the most part, unless I'm singing or something like that. And I love gum, so when it was a bubble gum theme that uh, the Lord laid on my heart, I was excited for it. Um, we're gonna, I realized that gum is not in the Bible. I don't know if you realize that or not. It wasn't. Uh, so I had to think out of the box, and I'm going to go with uh, the Samaritan woman at the well from John 4. I'm looking forward to what the Lord has put on my heart to share with everyone. We will have a dinner provided, and we will have... Now, I know you guys are probably thinking we will have a jar with bubble gum, and you have to name how many, you know, guess how many pieces of gum are in there. We're not doing that. Then you might think, well, we're going to have a bubble blowing contest. No, we're not doing that either. We are going to play The Price is Right, back by popular demand. I have more people come to me and say, can we play The Price is Right at the next one? So I have promised we will play The, Pr the Price is Right. And um, who's the host of that? Price is Right? Who's the host? Is it Bob Barker? Is it Bob Barker? Okay. Judy's going to be Bob Barker. Is it Bob Barker? Are we? Drew, Drew, Drew Carey, thank you so much. We were not going to be dismissed until we settled this. Okay, yes, Drew Carey is going to be, it's not, you're not going to be. She will, she would prefer Bob Barker, okay. I digress. We're playing uh, The Price is Right. Every lady's going to um, have a chance to come up with against another lady and name the retail price from Publix, so do your homework. 
Uh, you'll have an item from Publix to guess the price. Whoever has the closest to the actual price will win that item. It's always a lot of fun. So I want you to invite friends. Every lady's welcome. If you need a ride, just let me know. I'd be happy to get you or arrange for a ride for you. God bless you. All right. Go ahead and stand, please. Dr. Ainsworth, would you come to close us in prayer? And ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to get your pets spayed and neutered. Okay. <laughs> Price is right, Joe. Price oh, that's right. <laughs> With that, we'll close in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Word of God, Lord, and that we've heard your Word preached this morning, and we can apply it to our hearts. Help us to strive together in unity at Northstone Baptist, and we have that here, Lord. Help us to continue to do that, Lord, and but be aware of our adversaries as well. Lord, I pray as we go from here this morning. Lord, we would seek to honor you. May others see Christ in us. Where will we go this afternoon? Lord, we look forward to uh, hearing, seeing the performance from the Shining Light Players. Lord, may it speak to our hearts through the life of Amy Carmichael. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.